Welcome everyone to the fourth and final webinar in our Converge to Transform series. Um, today we're going to be talking about hacking biology to advance medicine. Um, to get us started, I just wanted to go over a few quick reminders. First, the session is being recorded um, and we ask you to keep your microphone muted um, the whole time. The chat box is going to be disabled while our speakers are giving their presentations. Um, and then we're going to re-enable it um, at the end for a consolidated Q&A with all of the speakers. Right after the Q&A, we're going to break up into little groups. Um, so each speaker will have their own break room and you can um, join them there to engage in more in-depth conversation with them after the talks. I want to start out also by thanking uh, our speakers today. I'm really excited to hear these talks. It's very innovative work that everyone is doing. Uh, I want to thank our staff who have been tremendous in getting this entire webinar series going, uh, particularly since we had to pivot so quickly from the two day uh, in person symposium we were hoping to have. Um, and I think they did a wonderful job reimagining that um, and and really reaching the CUNY community with, with this series. Uh, I also wanna thank all of our event sponsors and in particular wanna thank CUNY Office of Research which has provided us some funding as well. And finally, I wanna thank all of our participants, not just today, but throughout the series. Uh, we had so many people um, and they came to listen to us from 18 different CUNY schools and colleges. Um, and hopefully next time it will be every single one of the CUNY schools and colleges, but we're tremendously excited that so many people took the time during this incredibly difficult um, period uh, to join us for one or all four of the webinars, so thank you. Um, and then before we get started, I, I usually take this moment to introduce the fact that we've released our strategic plan and that we really would like your feedback on it. That's on our website, you can find it there. But I also wanted to address something um, that's maybe more pressing for many of us who are excited about the fact that higher education research is part of phase one for New York City, um, excited about the fact that New York City has progressed to phase two, and that soon CUNY research is going to be reopening um, with guidance from CUNY Central. Uh, and I wanted to highlight that the ASRC has been working on our plans um, for weeks now, and we have uh, a really detailed document that I think allows for research to, to begin again and uh, better than ever with the safety and health of, of everyone involved in mind. Um, we have a multi-staged plan. Um, we are hoping soon uh, to be approved to go into phase two, which will double the amount of occupants in the building and start our most critical experiments while we test out all of the, uh, and make sure that all of the precautions that we're taking are being complied with and that everything is moving forward in terms of the health metrics in New York City. And then um, two weeks later, opening up to that 50% capacity that we're allowed during um, this phase. And uh, one of the reasons we're really excited about it, obviously, is to get the research going up in the building, and in particular, to get our core facilities up and running for all of those of you out there um, that rely on our core facilities to do your own research. So although in phase two, we're limiting it to ASRC members, uh, in phase three, we're going to be, begin opening up the core facilities uh, to non-ASRC members. But right now, you can already uh, use the link that I've listed here to submit a request for access to the ASRC to do your research. We'd really like to hear from you so that we can plan your time in our facilities um, and make sure that you have access to do your work. Uh, we're going to be launching a website that's going to have all of our policies and guidelines for reopening. Um, so everyone can see those before they come to the building. Um, and in addition, for any of you out there who are writing guidance for departments or schools or campuses, um, if you have any questions about what our plans are, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to uh, talk with and, and collaborate with anybody on the very difficult task of reopening our buildings um, during this time. So in that collaborative spirit, we're here for the Converge to Transform webinar, talking about hacking biology to advance medicine. So what does that mean exactly? Um, I like the term hacking biology, um, may not be used very commonly, but a hack is a clever technique for doing or improving something. 
And in the context of biomedical efforts, it's referring to the vast array of approaches scientists are taking to use existing biological principles and materials, flip them on their heads and use that to revolutionize medical therapies. Um, so over on the left here, I'm showing um, an example from our structural biology initiative where what they're doing, one of the things that they're doing is taking light sensitive proteins from marine animals, bacteria, and even plants like this little video, um, and then incorporating those sensors in other contexts in order to control gene expression or modify cell signaling. And this is actually leading to um, startup companies um, and some work that will uh, target interventions. Today, we're going to learn from our speakers about a variety of ways that they're hacking biology um, in order to uh, treat cancer as well as cardiovascular and inflammatory diseases, um, in order to hack cancer cells so that they reveal themselves to clinicians instead of hiding away, or in fact, for cancer cells to kill themselves, um, and then hacking the basic building blocks of our biology, our DNA, to build molecular machines. Um, so I think this is going to be a really exciting set of talks. And in order to kick it, kick it off, I'm going to introduce Ryan Uline, who is the director of the ASRC's Nanoscience Initiative. He's also the Einstein Professor of Chemistry at Hunter College, and he's one of our most creative hackers. Um, he takes advantage of all of the building blocks of life to create materials and systems that can be controlled and manipulated to improve technology in a wide array of applications from energy to medicine to environmental protection. So with that, uh, Ryan. Thank you, Nina. Um, and th thanks for the introduction. And um, yeah, super excited about hopefully the only a few days away from actually starting research again. So it's, uh, it's, it's exciting. Exciting, exciting times ahead, I guess, and hopefully uh, in a very, very uh, distant future. So welcome everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure um, to, uh, to, to be here this afternoon. Um, I hope you're all well and excited about the event that we, we have for you. Um, so I'm, as, as Nina said, the director of the Nanoscience Initiative here at the ASRC. Um, and uh, this, this afternoon we have four speakers who will share very interesting ways of exploiting, repurposing, enhancing, or improving biological mechanisms as new uh, medical treatments. These are truly interdisciplinary researchers with backgrounds in nanotechnology, structural biology, biomedical engineering, so very much in the spirit of the SRC. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very good lineup. Um, that we have for you uh, this afternoon. Uh, as you probably all know, uh, the SRC, at the SRC, we pride ourselves to, uh, into developing innovative approaches to help solve 21st century challenges. And many of them relate, relate to uh, medical and, and healthcare issues. And uh, so an important theme has transpired in the building is to take inspiration from the living world to, to develop new technology to measure, direct, and repair biological systems for healthcare. And it's kind of interesting that Nina came in um, about a year ago now, I believe, and um, she, uh, I, I guess, looked around and took all these ideas and said, hey, you guys are hacking biology, and that, that really stuck. I think it's a, it's a very good, uh, good phrase. Um, so our three internal speakers and our keynotes uh, share examples of this concept. We will hear about hacking of biology's communication systems. We'll hear hacking of biology's survival mechanisms. We're, we're, we'll hear about hacking of biology's molecular interactions and hacking the immune system uh, and all of this for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. So first up is I'm very, very excited to introduce uh, Joy, who I've never met in person. We had invited her over to the ASRC to come and give a talk. That never happened, so but we're glad to have you um, virtually this time, and do hope to make the 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 the, the, the real uh, visit happen. Also, uh, Joy joins us from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, she received her PhD from um, uh, the University of the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, in in Beijing, I believe, and this was in collaboration with Houston uh, Methodist Hospital in Texas. 
Uh, she received her, B, uh, her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Helsinki in Finland. Uh, so Joy is Finnish. Um, she, uh, she leads a nanomedicine research lab uh, that is focused on the development of nanoparticles for treating cancer and other life-threatening diseases. She's the director of the Nanomedicine and Extracellular Vesicles Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, holds affiliate faculty positions at the Houston Methodist Hospital and University of North Florida. She's a board member um, and scientific advisor a number of companies. And she also has a personal mission, uh, which is to inspire and support underrepresented minorities in science and to make science more accessible to the general public, to very close to uh, what we, we, uh, we try to do here at the ASOC, very well aligned. She's also a TED speaker, and she serves as, as the chair of education and outreach uh, working group at the uh, National Cancer, Cancer Institute. Um, so uh, Joy made a lot of impact uh, in, in her career so far. She was just gonna list a few things here and then we'll get going. Um, she made it to the MGen Scholars 10 to Watch list. She was selected one of 12 internationally accomplished Finns along, alongside some Nobel laureates. Um, she was also listed on Forbes under 30 in healthcare for 2019. And she's part of the Global Young Academy. So truly outstanding credentials uh, for a, um, a, 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 a scientist. Um, Extracellular vesicles that she uh, will speak to us about are naturally occurring nanoparticles that are secreted by all cells and recently have been recognized as a tremendous way to, uh, uh, to, to, for repurposing for enhanced therapeutic purposes. That's the topic of her talk. So I asked her specifically prior to this what she, what she would mean by hacking biology. And her answer was tapping into the body's communication system for ther therapeutic purposes. Joy, I really look forward to your talk. Uh, the screen is yours. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here with uh, so many great speakers and attendees. And thank you for taking the time and thank you for the opportunity to talk about um, my lab's research. And so, as you heard, I'll be talking about um, extracellular vesicle therapeutics and what are these so-called extracellular vesicles. You heard a little bit about it, but they're basically biological nanoparticles that have this lipid bilayer. And so in this image, you see uh, um, a transmission electron microscope uh, image of these extracellular vesicles, and you can see that they're approximately 100 to 200 nanometers, and you see this uh, lipid bilayer. But they also contain biologically active molecules, such as RNA and proteins and carbohydrates. And as you heard, they're secreted by all the cells in our body. And this also means that they're um, present in the blood, in the saliva, in cerebrospinal fluid, in pancreatic in urine, and they play a very important role in cell communication. And so you may have heard of exosomes and exosomes are one subcategory of extracellular vesicles. And they form in these multivesicular bodies inside the cell and are then secreted. And there's also microvesicles, which is another subcategory that bud directly from the cell membrane. And so, it's quite difficult to distinguish whether you have a microvesicle or exosome because we don't have any curves that can be used for this. And also the current methods for separating um, extracellular vesicles don't distinguish between microvesicles and exosomes. So within the field, it's recommended to use this general term extracellular vesicles, and that's what I will be using. Um, but both the microvesicles and the exosomes are thought to play a very cell communication. So I like to think of them as the text messages of the body. So for example, if the cells in your intestines want to send a message to the brain, they can encapsulate it into this um, extracellular vesicle. And so it's very, they're very important for both uh, long distance and short distance intercellular communication. Um, but you would then think that if we could tap into this text message system or communication system, that there would be a lot of therapeutic potential. 
So why is it that we don't have um, clinically approved extracellular vesicle therapeutics? And I think the main challenge here has been how do we uh, concentrate them and purify them? Um, and in the literature, the most common method of doing this is ultracentrifugation. But this method has a lot of challenges. So for instance, in the isolation process of obtaining these extracellular vesicles, you actually lose most of them. You get very low purity, so you end up isolating um, proteins and other contaminants. In addition to that, it's very time consuming. So approximately one month to get enough extracellular vesicles to inject a single mouse. Um, it's labor intensive. It's not really clinically scalable. There are very few um, companies clinical grade outpatient facilities um, and it also causes damage because it's like you in a roller coaster times a million that's how fa fast these extracellular vesicles are spinning so you're gonna um, aggregate them they can release their content and the membrane can become damaged and then between these ultracentrifugation steps you also have pipetting steps so you're introducing human error which leads to low batch to batch consistency and we know that it's important to consistently um, manufacture batches for regulatory purposes. And so what we've been thinking is that we really need to step away from ultracentrifugation and use an alternative isolation method to overcome all of these challenges. And one of the main methods that we've been using is tangential flow filtration. And here you see a video of that um, technique. And you can see that um, we have liquid going from one this tubing uh, through a filter to another end. And how this differs uh, from uh, conventional or dead-end filtration when you push a liquid uh, through a filter with a specific pore size is that in this case the liquid is flowing tangentially or horizontally so you avoid clogging and, and when you don't have this filter cake formation you're able to more accurately and efficiently separate the extracellular vesicles. And we do this in several steps. So in the first step, we use a filter to get rid of everything that is uh, larger than extracellular vesicles. And in the second step, we use the filter to get rid of everything that is smaller than um, the extracellular vesicle population we're looking for. And at the same time, as we're filtering a specific size, um, either from cell culture media, from uh, patient liquids, um, we are also concentrating and purifying the extracellular vesicles. And then we use nanoparticle tracking analysis. And here you see a video of nanoparticle tracking analysis um, where you see the Brownian motion of these particles and the software will analyze this video and let us know what is the concentration and size distribution of our extracellular vesicles. So back in 2018, we published this study where we compared the, the most common method, ultracentrifugation, to tangential flow filtration. And we found that from the same starting liquid, we could get a lot more extracellular vesicles and, and the purity was higher. So in this purity graph, you see albumin and albumin is a protein contaminant that we would like to get rid of if we're focusing on extracellular vesicles. And you see that a lot of it is actually left after ultracentrifugation, but TFF gets rid of most of it. So this was um, very promising. Um, and we showed that we, would, we could effectively extracellular vesicles from cell culture media and here you see the solid lines are a lot more consistent than the dashed lines that are ultracentrifugation. So in terms of, of size distribution, we get higher batch to batch consistency. And we were able to verify that our extracellular vesicles had extracellular vesicle enriched markers such as CD63 and CD81 and lacked intracellular markers such as calnexin. But cell culture media is very simple liquid. So what if we use this method for more complex um, liquids from the body where we can't really control um, what, what is in these um, liquids. So we used lipoaspirate. So this is basically a liquid fat taken from liposuction from patients. And in this case, we were also able to isolate extracellular vesicles with uh, rel relatively um, good biodistribution that was reproducible. And again, we saw that we had those extracellular vesicle enriched characteristics and size under the microscope. In addition, we made sure that from the surgical incision to taking the liposuction to actually producing the extracellular vesicles, 
um, we could keep this in a closed system, in a sterile system, and we did not have bacteria or mycoplasma or endotoxins. And then when we looked at the actual yield here, um, we could see that from 150 milliliters of uh, lipoaspirate, so that's not a lot, all of us have at least 50 milliliters of fat, we actually got enough extralayer vesicles to inject 50 mice. So um, that is a lot compared to, to traditional methods where we use, where we um, waiting one month to produce enough for. And so now that we had this effective method of actually isolating the axillary vesicles, um, we've been using them or assessing the therapeutic properties in various uh, disease models. And I'll talk about one of those today, which is myocarditis. And the reason we're focused on myocarditis is because it's a serious condition. It's inflammation of the heart muscle. And it's actually responsible for 20% of all sudden deaths in the US. Um, the most common cause used to be Coxsackie virus V3, but today uh, COVID-19 also causes a lot of uh, myocarditis. So we've teamed up, my lab has teamed up with Dr. Fairweather, and she has developed this mouse model that is very clinically relevant. So um, what we do is that we take some heart proteins from the mouse, we mix it with a very um, low concentration of the virus. So it's a hybrid viral autoimmune model. And we see that inflammation peaks around day 10 to 14 in these mice. And then we can assess this um, inflammation through histology. And so the extralayer vesicles, that we used to um, assess therapeutic efficacy was from adipose tissue. You already heard that I mentioned lipoaspirate. And the reason we're interested in this tissue is that there's hundreds of publications out there showing that um, mesenchymal stem cells, including those from adipose tissue, have anti-inflammatory properties by secreting these extracellular vesicles. And even some of the proteins and microRNAs um, that are in these adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cell vesicles have been characterized in the literature. Um, but instead of using the actual cells, we, we decided to use a more efficient approach because anytime you culture cells, even though you can isolate actually vesicles in large amounts, you're still gonna slow down that process because you have to expand the cells in culture to get enough actually vesicles. So this usually takes at least during this month, if you want to translate this, you need to keep the cells in clinical grade uh, facilities. And of course, you're also expanding typically these cells, these mesenchymal stem cells on plastic in a 2D environment. So potentially you're losing a lot of native properties um, many of you that work with cell culture use FBS, so that's from cows. Um, anytime we're going to clinical studies, we can't use uh, cow-derived products, so you have to overcome those issues and find other techniques to grow the cells. And as I mentioned, even though we have those efficient isolation methods, we still get a low actually a vesicle yield when we deal with cell culture. So the question we asked is, what would happen if we directly took the extracellular vesicles from adipose tissue? And we know that some of those extracellular vesicles would be from the mesenchymal stem cells in this tissue, but in general, it would be a mixed population. Could this mixed population have any um, anti-inflammatory effects? And so here you see, um, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Shapiro, who's a physician at Mayo Clinic, we use this FDA approved device called Lipogems. And so you shake this fat in this device and it will separate the cells from the acellular products. And typically what they do is they do a liposuction and this is non-obese patients. And to obtain the cells, those adipose derived mesenchymal cell, uh, stem cells and they inject them for instance into the knee of patients. So with knee pain. Um, but you see that this device is connected to this tubing that goes to a waste bag on the floor. So the waste bag is everything um, except the, the cells. Um, so typically this is thrown away frequently in the clinic. But of course, this is something that we're very interested in seeing the extracellular vesicles in the adipose tissue and what type of effects those have instead of throwing away um, this liquid. And so we've been... Um, Studying this uh, lipoaspirate extracellular vesicles, putting the bag 
directly through the tangential flow filtration to obtain those lipoaspirate extracellular vesicles. This takes um, a few hours. From the same patient, we also take the cells, grow them in cell culture. This takes several months. Then put the cell culture media through the same uh, TFF to obtain the extracellular vesicles. And we compare them side by side. So a few hours versus several months. And then when we look at them under uh, transmission electron microscopy, the interesting thing we found, but it's also expected, is that when we take them directly from cell culture, so this adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cell vesicles, we only see extracellular vesicles. But we, when we take them from the adipose tissue, we actually see two populations of biological nanoparticles. One is the extracellular vesicles and the other is the lipoproteins. And this makes sense because the TFF is very good at separating a specific size, but it can't distinguish between different types of nanoparticles. And in this case, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing because there are a lot of lipoproteins such as HDL that have shown um, anti-inflammatory properties. And if you look at the yield here, so the few hour process will give us a lot more extracellular vesicles um, then compared to the, the month process. So very efficient method. And we've looked in cell culture at how these extracellular vesicles can prevent um, inflammatory pathways. We focused on macrophages because we know they are one of the main drivers of myocarditis. And what happens is that these macrophages was, will infiltrate into the heart and the main pathway this toll-like receptor 4 pathway that will cause these inflammatory cytokines to be released. So when we treat these macrophages with LPS, so that's a TLR4 ligand, together with our um, lipoaspirate extracellular vesicles or nanoparticles, we can suppress these inflammatory cytokines. And surprisingly, to a very similar extent as the traditional adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cell extracellular vesicles that have been shown in literature and we've also shown but they're not in this specific graph. We've also done some next generation sequencing. And the interesting thing is that five, so half of the 10 most highly expressed microRNAs in our extracellular vesicles have previously been linked to TLR4 suppression. So potentially a mechanism here is um, these microRNAs suppressing uh, TLR4 activation. We also know that um, in myocarditis, the endothelial cells get inflamed and they recruit, help to recruit these macrophages into the heart. So we looked at those adhesion molecules on endothelial cells, and we saw a similar effect that our lipoaspirate nanoparticles, or extracellular vesicles, suppress these um, um, adhesion molecules that recruit macrophages. So that's uh, promising. And then we also injected these um, nanoparticles into this mouse model that I mentioned in the beginning. And we saw pretty dramatic results um, where the mice that received the, the lipoaspirate nanoparticles or extracellular vesicles had lower um, inflammation in the heart. TLR4 levels were reduced. When we looked at macrophage infiltration into the heart, this was also suppressed. And we also saw some anti-inflammatory effects on the complement pathway. So this was um, exciting. And in addition to that, there's some interesting differences. Um, so we know from the literature that typically um, males with myocarditis have more cardiac TLR4 macrophages compared to females. And we know that TLR4 has also contributed to sex differences in cardiac inflammation. So when we compared um, in preliminary studies, female lipoaspirate nanoparticles to male lipoaspirate nanoparticles, it seems that potentially the female lipoaspirate nanoparticles would have more therapeutic effects in myocarditis. Can we make these um, extracellular vesicles even better? So tapping into biology, but then further improving it. So we've also loaded these uh, extracellular vesicles with conventional anti-inflammatory drugs. And there's many ways to load extracellular vesicles with therapeutic agents. And one of the more simple ways is, is mixing. And this works when you have um, small molecules that are hydrophobic. They will actually go into the bilayer and you can achieve pretty high loading efficiency. And so the drug that, one of the drugs that we've tried is guanabens and it's a clinically approved and it's previously been shown to suppress TLR4. And we can see that when we load it into our extracellular vesicles, it's slowly released over time, which is what we would expect from a drug delivery system. 
And the gray bars in this graph will show you that when we combine the lipoaspirate extra vesicles and nanoparticles together with the drug, we get even more uh, substantial suppression of these anti-inflammatory cytokines. So that's exciting. But we've also looked at more uh, exciting drugs that are not yet clinically approved. So for instance, Cas9, can we put Cas9 sections? In this case, mixing won't work because it's a huge protein. Um, so we've used the nanoparticle delivery system, so a synthetic nanoparticle to get this Cas9, fluorescent Cas9 into the EVs, um, which slightly increases the size but what's important to note is that um, typically these cationic nanoparticles that we use in cell culture are very efficient in getting um, RNA and proteins into cells. However, um, they're toxic in vivo. So when you see a high SATA potential or surface charge, that will probably induce immunotoxicity. But when we put these um, synthetic nanoparticles together with the EVs, the SATA potential remains negative. Um, we see an increase in size in the second graph, which is expected. And quite um, surprisingly, we saw that the method of using epsilon vesicles for Cas9 delivery was actually more effective than electroporation um, in this case. So potentially we could use these um, epsilon vesicles as drug delivery systems for um, proteins and RNA-based therapeutic agents. So with that being said, this was a brief um, summary of the projects that we're working on. We also work a lot with actually vesicle diagnostics. Um, so if you're interested, you can look at the, the website and the publications to learn more. But I do want to thank the amazing lab members that have um, contributed to this work and led this work, our collaborators, especially um, Dr. Fairweather and Dr. Shapiro and our funding sources. And thank you for um, your time today. You can follow our scientific updates on Twitter at Wolfram Joy. And this is my, my lab logo adapted from uh, Johnny Walker. So thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Joy. Um, so we're going to go straight on to the, the, the three speakers and we have Q&A at the end, but that was a, a great start. I love Johnny Walker Black Label, so that was a good thing to think about for later today. Uh, so, but yeah, questions, questions for later, please. So you can, you can, uh, you can type, type them in the Q&A uh, function uh, whenever, whenever you, you, you wish. So um, the, the next speaker is uh, Professor Jill Bargonetti, who is a professor in biology from Hunter College. She's a New Yorker, uh, done her BA at SUNY Purchase, PhD at NYU and postdoc at Columbia University. She won um, some very imp impressive awards, including uh, the, pr the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers for, uh, given to her by President Bill Clinton. Um, the New York City Mayor's Award for Excellence in Science and Technology, uh, an Outstanding uh, Woman Scientist Award from the Associate, Association for Women in Science, um, and, and, and others um, as well. Um, she's a, a great educator um, at Hunter College in, in the biology department. And she stands out for not just being an amazing molecular biologist, she's also, she also has a love for science and, and dance also, and she has managed to integrate these two. She teaches a class called Choreographing Genomics. Um, and my understanding is that this is where students get to express a cancer gene by using dance, but only after they understand the molecular mechanisms of this. So um, for, for the students um, on, on the call today, uh, perhaps if you, if you're at Hunter, maybe this is something you can see if you can sign up for. It sounds, uh, it sounds really fun. Wouldn't be for me though. I'm not a great dancer, I'm afraid. Um, so her research uh, focuses on precision medicine, uh, in particular uh, to tackle triple negative breast cancer. And when asked what, what hacking biology means to her, um, Jill uh, said um, it, it means hacking what the cancer cell uses for survival and turning this into a death trap. So that sounds like a, 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 a wonderful idea. She focused on a, a mutant 
uh, of a, a p53 uh, protein uh, to achieve this and um, uh, Jill, I very much look forward to your talk so over to you thank you very much can you hear me yeah okay great Alrighty, so I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my work. I'm really happy to be sharing this with the speakers and attendees from this meeting and hope that some collaborations will come from this in terms of trying to hack this mutant P53 pathway. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about targeting the oncogenic mutant p53 protein to detect and treat triple negative breast cancers. So we're basically hacking this mutant p53 that cancer cells use for survival and trying to allow that uh, to be a mechanism for detection and therapeutics. So there's currently an unmet clinical need for positive markers for triple negative breast cancer. Importantly, mutant P53 is expressed in greater than 80% of triple negative breast cancers. But it's really underappreciated that um, mutant P53 is present in high levels in cancer cells. And we believe we can capitalize on this underappreciated fact that the mutant P53 protein is very stable in cancer cells, while in normal cells, the wild type P53 has a very short half-life. So wild type P53 is well known as a tumor suppressor, but apart from its tumor suppression ability, many missense mutations of P53 express stable proteins that have gained new oncogenic functions. These functions become particularly important when considering certain subtypes of breast cancer. The 2012 report from the Cancer Genome Atlas Network showed that in over 80% of triple negative breast cancers, there is expression of mutant P53. The knowledge that mutant P53 can gain new functions, therefore, suggests that for triple negative breast cancer, mutant P53 protein expression may be a targetable biomarker. Hacking this stable mutant P53 is not only made important by the TCGA database, but also by the Metabrick database, where they looked at over 2,000 patient samples and saw that in estrogen receptor negative breast cancers, 77% have triple negative breast cancer, have mutant P53. So the TP53 gene mutations are the most common genetic lesion in human cancers. And in breast cancers, a spectrum of hotspot missense mutations are found in the DNA binding domain. Such mutations cause amino acid substitutions at residues that are critical for wild type P53 to make site-specific interactions with downstream target genes. When these amino acid substitutions occur, the mutant P53 protein loses its tumor suppressor transcription factor ability. Often, as in the case of R175, R248, and R273 substitutions, this results in stable mutant P53 with gain of function properties. Importantly, the oligomerization domain and the C terminal basic domains of P53 regulate the DNA binding properties, and these regions remain unchanged in the gain-of-function mutants. This suggests that this region may contribute to mutant P53 DNA interactions. Today I'll tell you some of our published results before sharing our unpublished work on how the C-terminal and the oligomerization domain, uh, which are C-terminal to the DNA binding domain, influence the mutant P53 structure and function and also how they potentially can be utilized as a scaffold for targeting and diagnostics. So in 2015 and 2017, we reported on proteomic studies that showed gain-of-function mutant P53 in breast cancers could directly change the chromatin-associated proteome. We began these studies by investigating the nonspecific chromatin association of the highly stable mutant P53 in a number of different breast cancer cell lines. We found, by using fractionation protocols, that mutant P53 tightly tethers to the chromatin. As you can see, in this western blot, 
with the high mobility forms of mutant P53 tethered to the chromatin. Moreover, when we created inducible mutant P53 knockdown cell lines and analyzed their altered proteomics by stable isotope labeling and cell culture, we found that mutant P53 depletion causes a striking reduction in all six replication helicase subunits, MCM2 through MCM7. We also found that mutant P53 knockdown results in the reduction of chromatin associated. PARP1. The thought then was that we could target this PARP1 on the chromatin in the presence of DNA damage by utilizing a PARP inhibitor to trap PARP on the chromatin. We assumed that the MCM2 through 7 helicase complex would then collide with the trapped PARP. So here you see that when triple negative breast cancer cells expressing mutant P53 R273H were treated with the PARP inhibitor talazoparib plus temozolomid, the cells underwent apoptosis, evident as green cells in live imaging for activated caspase. Knocking down mutant P53 blocks this killing, and so does inhibition of the processivity of the MCM helicase by using ciprofloxacin. This suggested a molecular model in which mutant P53 associates directly with replicating DNA and helps to alleviate replication stress by recruiting PARP1 to repair the DNA during active cell proliferation of breast cancer cells. We tested this model using immunoprecipitation of nascent DNA by using EDU-labeled DNA, as well as using a proximity ligation assay to determine if mutant P53 was found with newly incorporated EDU marks. We found, using the two complementary methods, that nascent EDU associates with both mutant P53 and PARP in immunoprecipitation assays, as well as in proximity ligation assays, as can be seen by these red puncta. Moreover, we found increasing the parlation in cells also increased the mutant P53 association with replicating DNA. So at this point, we wondered if the mutant P53 present in high levels and on replicating DNA could be used as a detection agent. The stability and overexpression of mutant P53 in triple negative breast cancers as compared to wild type P53 in normal cells makes mutant P53 a promising target for diagnostic and theranostic imaging. Furthermore, the oligomerization domain of mutant P53 presents a promising scaffold for the creation of imaging agents based on mutant P53 oligomerization. We've generated a Psi-5 P53 TET molecule. Psi-5 P53 TET is a novel nucleus penetrating mutant P53 oligomerization domain peptide to the tetramerization domain of mutant P53. This mutant P53 oligomerization main peptide contains the P53 tetramerization domain sequence conjugated to a Psi-5 fluorophore for near-infrared fluorescence imaging, as well as an HIV TAT sequence for directing the molecule into the nucleus. We've used confocal microscopy in order to image this near-infrared fluorescence imaging agent. This allows us to determine the uptake of Psi-5 P53 TET in triple negative breast cancer cells as compared to estrogen receptor positive cells with wild type P53 expression. Near infrared fluorescence imaging was used to study the in vivo behavior of Psi-5 P53 TET in mice bearing subcutaneous bilateral TMBC versus estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. I'll show you a few pieces of our exciting developments with these molecules. 
Confocal microscopy and flow cytometry, which I'm not showing in the interest of time, demonstrated higher uptake of Psi-5 P53 TET into triple negative breast cancer cells that expressed mutant P53 R273H, much higher than what we saw in MCF7 cells that expressed wild type P53. This mimicked the higher level stability of mutant P53 in the triple negative breast cancer cells. Quantification of the Psi-5 P53 TET uptake in the ER positive versus the triple negative breast cancer cells bore out this fact that there was more uptake of Psi-5 P53 TET in the triple negative breast cancer cells. We also asked if Psi-5 P53 TET could accumulate in mutant P53 xenograft tumors. Before implantation of the cells, we examined the P53 levels in the estrogen receptor positive versus the TMBC cells. Western blot analysis again showed higher P53 in the TMBC cells. We carried out in vivo optical imaging of Psi-5 P53 TET uptake in mice bearing the bilateral xenograft model. A representative image 30 minutes after the the injection of Psi-5 P53 TET is shown here. And while you can see that the ER positive tumor is bigger, we do not see detection, whereas we see detection in the triple negative breast cancer tumor. We also carried out epifluorescence imaging of this ER positive versus TMBC tumor excised 80 minutes after administration of Psi-5 P53 TET. We used epifluorescence intensity to quantify the uptake of the tumors and saw that mutant P53 expressing tumors have a higher intensity at a short incubation of 40 minutes, even though the tumors in general are smaller. Tumor tissue was resected at 40, 80, and 100 minutes post-injection, and then we lysed the tumor tissue and examined the Psi-5 P53 TET uptake. And again, we saw at the shorter time point, TMBC tumors had the highest uptake of Psi-5 P53 TET. We therefore asked if reduction of mutant P53 reduced Psi-5 P53 TET uptake and Psi-5 P53 TET um, interacting directly with this mutant P53. Cells were imaged by confocal microscopy after 30 minutes, 2 hours, 4 hours, and 24 hours of incubation with 500 nanomole of Psi-5 P53 TET. Um, hoist staining was used to see the nuclei. Three independent experiments with biological replicates were performed. As you can see, when we reduced the P53 by shRNA mediated knockdown, we also reduced the uptake of Psi-5 P53 TET. The quantification of the Psi-5 P53 uptake demonstrated a statistically significant decrease with mutant P53 depletion. Finally, we used immunoprecipitation to see if Psi-5 P53 TET could interact directly with uh, purified mutant P53, and we saw that, in fact, we could get a direct interaction between the Psi-5 P53 TET, seen here as compared to the IgG, with the mutant P53. So to test if this mutant P53 was indeed a tetramer, as this work suggested, as the Psi-5 P53 TET was interacting with the mutant P53, we used glutaraldehyde cross-linking assay that structurally links polypeptides that are forming oligomers so that they can be visualized by polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. We found that R273H mutant P53 which is the protein that was associating with the replicating DNA, indeed does form tetramers, as does the mutant P53 in a number of other breast cancer cell lines. We then asked if we changed the tetramerization domain by introducing a second missense mutation in the oligomerization domain, did we disrupt this tetramer formation? And in fact, you can see if we changed the position 347, we switched it to become a dimer. And if we change position 344, we switched it to become a monomer. 
We used the same triple negative breast cancer cell lines shown previously, expressing the R273H to target the oligomerization domain or the C-terminal basic domain so that we could examine if changing the P53 in actively replicating cells might influence the P53 structure and function. We utilized CRISPR-Cas9 in order to do these changes. We selected clones that were screened for mutant P53 levels at different cell cycle stages by examining asynchronous cells, cells blocked at the G1S border with a fiddle choline or thymidine, and cells blocked in G2 with nicotazole. We compared mutant P53 R273H frame shift, which basically had a knockdown of the P53, a deletion from 347 to 393, which made a smaller polypeptide, and a very small deletion from 381 to 388, which got rid of some of the C-terminal regulatory region. And then we asked what happened in terms of the function. It was critical to determine if we had in fact changed the oligomerization of the mutant P53, so that was the first thing that we looked at. Again, we used glutaraldehyde crosslinking to assess the tetramerization of the mutant P53 being expressed in these cells and found that the deletion from 347 to 393 in fact shifted the mutant P53 from being a tetramer to now being a monomer. And the smaller deletion just of the C-terminal did not. Um, there was a little bit of reduction, but we still had a tetramer formation. So we then asked if this changed any function. The cells with the mutant P53 deletion um, that no longer oligomerized replicated much more slowly than the cells with the full length mutant P53. And in fact, not only did they replicate more slowly, but when we looked at their ability to localize on chromatin, we found that without the tetramerization region, there was no longer any interaction with the chromatin. We then examined the C-terminal basic region deletion, which was just a smaller deletion. And again, we found that these cells with that deletion replicated more slowly than the cells with the full length mutant P53. And also, if we made mutations in um, transiently transfected proteins, we could see that this deletion just of the last 24 amino acids decreased the chromatin interaction for both wild type P53, so wild type P53 interacts with the chromatin the best. The mutant P53 is interacting not quite as well, and the deletion of the C-terminus still disrupts that chromatin interaction. So in conclusion, what have I told you of these results that we feel support hijacking mutant P53 in triple negative breast cancers? Gain of function mutant P53 associates with replicating DNA and uses its oligomerization domain and C-terminal basic regions to help with this. Sci-5 P53 TET is a nucleus-directed P53 tetramerization domain peptide that can detect cancer cells and tumors expressing stable mutant P53. Mutant P53 in breast cancer cells forms tetramers. This tetramer formation can be disrupted by changing the oligomerization domain through missense mutations or deletions. De deletion of this oligomerization domain results in mutant P53 monomers, and deletion of the C-terminus or the oligomerization domain decreases the ability of those cells to replicate. And so finally, I just want to thank my team in front of our beautiful Wild Cornell Hunter College Belfer building, um, specifically Georgia Noor, Devin Lundin, Viola Ellison, Clara Friedman, and Gu Zhao, who really did a huge amount of the work that I showed you today, and my collaborators, Brian Zieglis, and um, other members of his team and Wei Gang Chu, who did a lot of the bioinformatics from the first part that's been published. And I also want to thank the funding agencies, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, and thank you very much for your attention. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. And uh, ho hopefully the Belfer building will be opening soon, I guess, uh, similar stages as us. Uh, that's a, a beautiful building 
in, indeed. So thank you for that, 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 that great insight. Uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. So next up is Dr. Prabhadika Malakarachi, who is an assistant professor from the Department of Chemistry at Lehman College. Uh, Prabhadika got her PhD in chemistry uh, from the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, her master's in chemistry at the University of Louisiana at Monroe and her chemistry degree from the Institute of Chemistry in Sri Lanka, where she's from originally. Um, the Malikara lab uh, aims to develop functional molecular tools based on nucleic acid aptamers to control cellular responses with external stimuli. And they've developed um, a platform for this called uh, ligand guided selection. So when asked uh, what uh, she would mean by hacking, Probodica answered, uh, hacking is exploiting molecular interactions in nature to discover and design molecular machines using DNA nanotechnology. So Probodica, the screen is yours. I look forward to your talk. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for your introduction. So let me share my screen. Okay, so um, the, our lab is actually interested in uh, developing functional nanomaterials based on DNA and, and use them to control cellular behavior, um, uh, their response to external stimuli. So, um, so then uh, I just wanted to give you a brief background. Um, so as we all know that all living cells communicate uh, through, uh, with the environment through uh, different types of molecular sensors. So we uh, you know, call these sensors as receptors in, in biology and biochemistry and bi uh, chemical biology. So, so but in, in, in a true sense, actually, these are all um, biological molecules that are programmed to be sensors. And, and these sensors actually can, can can be categorized into different classes. Um, so uh, one category can be called as chemical sensors. So these are sensing uh, molecules or receptors that interact with um, different types of antibodies. And if the receptor is the enzyme that it can interact with the substrate, can interact with growth factors, peptides and hormones and other small molecules. And then um, in response to these molecules, and it can undergo series of cascades of reactions to um, elicit a cellular response. And the other type of uh, senses or, or receptors, we, call, we can call them as physical senses. So these molecules actually sense light, temperature, and mechanical stress or other type of physical um, forces uh, on the cells. And, and there are multiple um, types of receptors uh, are being identified. And we are particularly interested in photoreceptors or light control ion channels. So basically, these molecules respond to different types so wavelengths and then um, and, and facilitate uh, you know movements of ions through the cells, cell membrane, or, uh, or I think inhibit um, um, the movements of these ions. So those are the things that we are uh, very much interested in. And, and also um, uh, cells can be uh, senses, uh, cells can be cellular senses. So that which means that cells can sense themselves. Um, uh, cells can interaction, interact with other cells to form epithelial junctions or um, in, in, for example, in, in wound healing. Um, and, and there are numerous examples in the immune system where cell-cell interaction uh, occur to, to, uh, in res uh, to, to respond to any type of invasion, such as bacteria and viruses, or, or, or T cells can interact with antigen presenting cells to elicit immune response. And, and in, 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 in neurology, or new, uh, you can find so many different types of um, sensing uh, between cells uh, in, in neurological synapsi synaptic me mechanisms. So if you really think about it, so what common to through these all types of interactions? So these interactions are extremely selective or specific. Any type of um, perturbation to these uh, to this uh, selectivity or specificity can actually change the whole uh, response of these receptors to the, to the ligand or any type of um, uh, external stimuli. 
So uh, the goal of our lab is to integrate the specificity or the selectivity of these receptor interactions with the external stimuli in combinatorial screening to discover, uh, in our case, um, artificial nucleic acid ligands against uh, cell surface receptors. So basically what we plan to do is um, have a combinatorial uh, library of synthetic molecules and screen against the whole cells and then known uh, existing uh, molecular interactions between receptors and ligands or receptors with light, for example, to, to selectively identify or uh, uh, use this interaction as a guide to selectively identify um, artificial nucleic acid ligands against this receptor of, uh, we are interested in. And then use this highly selective um, artificial ligands that we uh, generated using this uh, screening process to engineer stimuli responsive DNA based molecular machines or nano devices and then go back and then apply them onto the same receptor that we went after to control and manipulate how it behaves and responds with external stimuli. So these are the two goals we are going after um, in our lab um, so far. So, um, so the DNA-based molecular devices and engineering of DNA-based molecular devices gaining a lot of push um, because of this recent success of different types of RNA therapeutics in the clinic. Um, so um, there are a number of devices being, uh, de are being developed uh, to actually sense the force between two cells um, and, and, uh, and then to measure how you know, when two cells interact, how, how the force changes based on different cell types. So these are miniaturized molecular machines that could be uh, utilized in, in, in measuring different types of cellular interactions. And then uh, quite a while ago, um, a church group actually introduced this a very smart uh, uh, nano device based on uh, DNA material, as using DNA as a material to basically engineer molecule or complex uh, scaffold that only uh, this particular machine or a robotic device um, uh, opens up when the certain cells express certain types of receptors. So this was done by incorporating uh, logic gates into the DNA design uh, to, to engineer these type of smart molecules. So um, these are the uh, couple of uh, very cool um, examples in, in right now uh, we have, and then there are so many others in literature if you want to do, look into it. So, and then um, there's another push from another angle in this nucleic acid research uh, uh, community is the introduction of xenonucleic acid. So there are so many different xenonucleic acids are available, but we are particularly interested in artificially expanded in genetic information system. So these are called AGIs. So uh, these are basically, um, uh, you know, modified nucleic acids, but obey Watson Creek base, base pairing and they can be independently replicated using uh, existing DNA polymerases or engineered DNA polymerases. So um, the Benner, Stephen Benner, who came out with this Aegis system, actually um, um, came out with multiple uh, types of uh, pairs of uh, a different DNA base pairing. And then actually recently he showed, which is, which, you know, attract uh, attention from all kinds of news uh, media that uh, they, they showed that the, uh, these um, engineered molecules with eight letters can actually uh, trans uh, translated uh, to artificial RNA system uh, in, in, a in vitro. So just, which is very, very cool as well. So uh, in, in to us, why this is important is because we can incorporate these type of extended uh, um, information system or synonucleic acids into our, in our molecular screening to enhance the chemical space of the DNA libraries, uh, which will allow us to give a better ligands with higher structural diversity. And, and also Floyd Romsberg, uh, formerly from Scripps, and then uh, John Chaput also uh, working uh, in, in similar directions uh, using xenonucleic acid, but also they are engineering different types of polymerases that um, uh, basically um, uh, that could um, polymerize different types of uh, xenonucleic acids that could be incorporated into uh, ligand screening process.
So now that I have given you an introduction of what these uh, molecules are and in the, uh, in the field of uh, nucleic acid uh, development, molecule development for either therapeutics or drugs or different types of molecular devices, most of the time that the, the recognition arm for these molecules are uh, what I used to, uh, what I would like to call is artificial nucleic acid ligands, uh, but they are also known as aptimers. So aptimers are synthetic uh, DNA, RNA, XNA, molecules. It binds to a target uh, with high affinity and specificity. And in also um, the interaction is a combination of multiple non-covalent uh, uh, interactions uh, that, uh, that by similar to uh, antibody antigen interaction. So um, versatility, so they are small. Uh, so because of that, uh, you can incorporate these molecules into nano devices without any, any issue because, uh, you know, having a bulky antibody in these, uh, you know, especially in molecular machine, in the context of molecular machines that you can really possibly, uh, you know, have anything functional. Um, so, and also you have multiple different types of modified nucleic acids available. So which allow us to precisely control of, of the uh, structural characteristics characteristic or chemical characteristic of these molecules. And then we can uh, gen uh, engineer different types of molecules uh, using these type of uh, uh, different uh, functionalities. So how uh, do we select aptimus? So the aptimus are selected first uh, designing a DNA RNA or now XNA or DNA XNA combination library. And, and so you heat them, these, these molecules, the single-stranded DNA, and then gently cool them down to physiological temperatures. So basically, they, they uh, fold into different shapes um, based on their sequence composition. And then these uh, secondary three uh, uh, tertiary structures, uh, second structures can bind to a protein target of interest. So you basically remove unbound sequences and then the bound sequences are eluted, PCR amplified, and then you repeat this process until the DNA library or selects library is enriched with um, a highly uh, high affinity aptimal molecules against the protein. So, um, so then, um, so there are a lot of aptimus in the field that's been selected using a single protein, but uh, what we are interested in cell surface receptors. But the issue with the cell surface receptors, which also known as complex target, especially if they are biologically and mechanistically interesting, these receptors are extremely complex and they are composed of multiple uh, components. So when you solubilize them in an artificial detergent system, what happens is that these complexes are not really mimic the native folding conditions in these detergents. So, so the, because of that, the purified cell surface proteins do not make good targets for aptima discovery or a nucleic acid ligand discovery. So one way of addressing this is um, you know, using a single-stranded DNA library and then use whole cells that expresses recept different types of receptors as the target. So this is what we call cell selects. So you incubate the whole single-stranded DNA library and then remove or wash the unbound uh, DNA sequences and then uh, you know, retain the bound sequence and you introduce a, what we call a negative selection step to remove any, any sequences that commonly interacting with any type of um, uh, expressed in any type of cells, and the, sometimes DNA or RNA uh, or XNA molecules can be sticky, so they can just stick. So, and then basically um, elude these sequences and then generate the single stranded library. So, when you have a cell selects library, what you get is the aptimus against whole cells. So, shown here is the cell selects process being repeated for 10 rounds, and here the 13 rounds. So, you can see this is a T cell, uh, uh, a cultured T cell line that is specifically recognized this DNA library in, uh, with the T cell, but not B cells that lacks the certain receptors we are going after. And then Basically, uh, so, so, but at, the, at this time, we don't know the target of these molecules uh, uh, highly enriched in this library. So in order to address this, we introduce a method called ligand-guided selection. So ligand-guided selection actually build on the cell selects technology platform. So what basically uh, we, we, we assume here is that the, this particular library contains potential aptimus against highly expressed receptors on a cell, on a 
a given cell. And then at any concentration that we use this evolved library, individual aptamer concentrations are below its dissociation constants. So with these two assumptions, what we do next is that the pre-incubated this library with this whole cells, and then we added a, um, the secondary ligand that known to interact with this receptor. It could be antibody towards the receptor or any other molecule, and then drive the equilibrium between this receptor uh, from aptamer to, uh, to the uh, uh, receptor interactions to antibody to the receptor interaction. And then we collect the outcompleted sequences and then um, uh, apply bioinformatics. Also, we, we, there can be, when you have an antibody interacting with the receptor, there can be a structural uh, changes to the target protein that uh, destabilize the aptamer uh, uh, receptor complex. So those sequences are also can be eluted. And then uh, basically we do a cloning sequencing and then identify aptamer candidates. So uh, the significance here is that we have, uh, this method allows you to basically um, identify synthetic nucleic acid ligands from a combinatorial library by utilizing uh, the existing uh, molecular interactions not known towards a certain receptor molecule without changing any, uh, anything, any, any, uh, uh, any components of the receptor. So these receptors are uh, in their native states, native functional states. So we identify an aptamer against membrane IgM, uh, which is a part of BCR, uh, B cell receptor complex expressed on B cell. And then we uh, truncated this aptamer to get a high affinity variant. What we show is that, we showed is that um, these uh, uh, truncated variants actually can also have the antigen specificity. And, and most interestingly, what we showed is that when you use the antibody that we use to out compete these uh, molecules below, its constant, uh, below the concentration of their dissociation constant, these aptamers can also block the antibody. So I'm running out of time, so I will be uh, going quickly uh, in, uh, for the next few slides. So basically what next we did is that we dimerized this aptamer because the antibodies are dimeric. So we, uh, we hope that we can further improve this, its affinity. And then we showed that uh, for, uh, it's not only these aptamers bind to um, the cultured cells in, in, in the lab. As you know, there's a, a problem with the life sciences that most of the molecules that we generate bias towards the culture conditions in a, in a laboratory. So we wanted to show that not only these are specific in, in, in a cultured la laboratory cell line, but also uh, against the B cells obtained from donors. So these are four donors, antibody, anti-IgM antibody binds to uh, these uh, these B cells, but uh, also dimeric aptamer binds. And then uh, non-B cells that lacks this particular receptor do not bind to both molecules. And then we took one other step further and then um, showed that uh, we screened a subset of uh, le leukemia uh, to show that these, ap which, which, is, which highly expresses this particular um, uh, IgM molecule on their surface and shows that the aptamers bind to that, but not the uh, T cells from the same patients. So um, the next uh, target we went after is TCRCD3, which is we are super interested in this molecule. And you can see that the structural complexity of this molecule, these are quite impossible to formulate in, in artificial buffers and then find, use them as, as uh, in ligand screening. So I'm not going to go over the detail of this particular method. This paper is published last year, so you can basically uh, read if you're interested. So what uh, the, the modification is that we actually incorporated primary cells from humans in the screening process both cell selects as well as legs to identify uh, precise aptamers against TCRCD3 because TCRCD3 is, is, uh, is a key receptor in the immune system expressing T cells and it would be really cool to find aptamers against them. Um, again, the bioinformatic, we created our own bioinformatic platform that I'm not going to go over. So again, uh, the, these are published. You can uh, go and uh, take a look at it if you're interested. So what we did is we found actually an aptamer, um, of multiple aptamers against TCRCD3 and multiple affinities, uh, which, is, which is amazing because there are no known synthetic ligands against TCRCD3 uh, until we found this aptamer. 
So right now, uh, what we are focusing on is that we truncated and dimerized the septum and then the, uh, the, the basically engineered multiple um, uh, uh, dimeric aptamas with variable linkers. And then we show that uh, this dimeric aptama that uh, with, with the structure closely resembled to antibody that used to elude this aptama um, is actually activate the TC, TCRCD3 uh, on, in T cells, which is really, really, really amazing because what we are showing now is that the, the, the molecules that we screen using the ligand guided selection actually can be used to, to elicit the same interaction that the antibody antigen uh, antibody does on the T cells. So there are no synthetic ligand uh, discovered against TCRCD3, uh, which tells you that shows you that how powerful this method could can be. And then we come, uh, we partnered with Stephen Benner, uh, in, in, uh, who introduced the artificially expanded genetic sy information system, Aegis uh, DNA, and then show that, so we can combine Ligs and Aegis, and then we can improve the chemical space, we can improve the structural diversity, and then introduce um, uh, multiple actimers against, again, TCRCD3, because we are really interested in this particular uh, receptor. So uh, basically take home message today for you guys is that, uh, you know, using a combinatorial library against um, and, and combining with the existing ligand receptor interactions, you can actually find artificial ligands. These ligands will have a applicability in a translational setting than uh, the ones that we can uh, we discover using a more artificial uh, buffer systems, for example. So right now we, are, we have so many projects going on. So the main projects are we are further expanding the diversity of the libraries for legs. We are also expanding the different types of targets that we are going after. Um, and also uh, we are combining Aptimus we already found with leaks with DNA nanotechnology to come up with devices. And, and we are trying to uh, develop a deep, deep learning approach to high, uh, analyze this high throughput um, uh, screening libraries that we have so many libraries we generate during these uh, screening processes so that it will be much easier to uh, do the bioinformatic part. And we have so many productive collaborations going on and we have uh, we've been long uh, working with bioinformatic co-facility in Einstein and genomic co-facility. And there are so many ongoing collaborations, especially in Memorial Sloan Carrying. And then there are other um, uh, institutions and universities. And there are many students contributed to this work. These are list, uh, listed here is like current students. And then funding always been multiple institutions um, uh, from NIH to NSF to private foundations. With that, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Probadika. Um, so uh, for some, uh, some great insights in uh, how uh, polynucleic acids are an incredibly versatile toolbox for, for hacking biology. So I look forward to the uh, discussion later. So please all keep your questions for later. So that, that brings me to the last uh, talk. It's a great pleasure to introduce our final speaker. Uh, Dr. Ryan Williams, who is still a new recruit to uh, City College uh, Biomedical Engineering Department. He joined City College from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in 2018. Um, and we're very happy that, that he, uh, he, joined, he joined us at CUNY. Uh, Ryan received his BA in Biology from the University of Virginia, PhD in Pharmaceutical and Pharmacological Sciences from West Virginia University, and he was previously a postdoctoral research fellow at Memorial Kettering Cancer Center in the lab of Dan Heller, who I think is actually on the call. So uh, welcome, welcome, uh, Dan. Nice that you could join us. Um, so Ryan develops optical nanosensors that are based on the unique uh, near IR emission properties of carbon nanotubes. And he develops non-invasive uh, methods for quantification of protein biomarkers. Um, uh, on the topic of hacking biology, um, he said, nothing says hacking more than non-invasively monitoring the inner workings of a system to create actionable knowledge. Engineer the tool to do just that by co-opting the antibody-antigen interactions of the immune system and a fluorescent sensor to report those interactions to the physician. So Ryan, I uh, look forward to your talk.
Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, and I think, uh, thanks Nina and thanks to all of the ASRC organizers for, for having me, uh, having me be here. I, I was, I was pleased to find out that I've been a hacker for, for the past 10 or 12 years and, and didn't even know it. So, uh, very, very cool. Um, so, uh, so I, I appreciate all of the, the three talks that, that came before me. Those were, those were really great, uh, really exciting work. Um, and, and hopefully uh, we can generate some discussion and potential collaboration and, and feedback here. Um, so like Ryan said, I am a new, fairly new assistant professor um, in biomedical engineering at, at CCNY. Um, and I, I, I just started in uh, last August in 2019. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, stuff that I did in my postdoc work. My lab has been closed longer than my lab has been open. Um, so, so I, I, I'm definitely looking forward to getting in the lab and, and getting my, my students going a bit more um, and continuing forward on, on new directions. But uh, this is some work that I did in uh, Dr. Heller's lab. Uh, so so uh, free shout out to Dan also for, for everything that he did to, to help with this work. Um, so I'm talking about a, a development of an implantable nanosensor um, that, that we use to detect ovarian cancer biomarkers in vivo. Um, and so just a bit of background on uh, ovarian cancer. So the, the rationale here is to develop a sensor that we can use to detect ovarian cancer earlier stages in the uh, progression of the disease, because it's the fifth most uh, uh, common female cancer um, uh, related deaths in the US. It accounts for over 225,000 uh, new diagnoses per year and 145,000 deaths uh, per year worldwide. Um, and this, this death number is, is, is surprisingly and uncomfortably close to that diagnosis number. And, and part of that is, is because we do, a, um, do a, a, a fairly bad job of detecting uh, disease at early stages. Um, so currently, uh, uh, all stages of disease detection, uh, the five-year prognosis for ovarian cancer is 44% is, um, survival. Um, however, with, uh, with the detection at uh, stage one, early stage detection, uh, we, have a, we do a really good job of treating surgical and, and um, uh, uh, pharmacological treatments of ovarian cancer. Uh, we end up with a 91% five-year survival. Unfortunately, the, the early detection methods are um, uh, really only about 15% of cases are detected at, at early stages. And so those early stage detection methods are uh, CA125 blood test um, and a transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, and so uh, a few years back, um, the FDA and the US Preventative Services Task Force um, no longer recommend the use of, of these two screening tools on a wide scale um, population-based screening method. Um, and that's because they have a lot of over-diagnoses as well as under-diagnoses a lot of false positives and, and also a fair amount of false um, negatives due to inability to see smaller tumors and, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so our strategy here uh, has been to develop uh, biomarkers or to detect biomarkers um, at the source. So biomarkers, we know uh, certain uh, biomarkers appear in the uterine cavity and the peritoneal cavity well before they do in the serum. Um, and they appear uh, 38 times higher uh, in the uterine cavity than they do in the serum as well. So higher concentrations at the local site. Uh, and also they, they appear um, ten, tenfold more in, in patients that have ovarian cancer versus other benign ovarian conditions. Um, and this work and, and showing some of these background levels uh, of these two biomarkers, CA125 and AG4, uh, showing that they're over overexpressed in ovarian cancer uh, is work done by our collaborator at NYU, um, which is uh, Doug Levine, who's a, a gynecological surgeon there. Um, so, so in our work, we actually developed an, uh, a biomarker for the HE or a sensor for the, HE, uh, the ovarian cancer biomarker HE4. Um, and so, this biomarker is as good or, or better in certain cases than than the FDA approved biomarker CA125. So we, uh, our strategy was to develop an implantable biosensor uh, for ovarian cancer. And like I said, this was done um, 
primarily through collaboration with all these great people in, in Dan's lab. Uh, so our strategy was to develop a, a nano sensor that we can place uh, near the near the ovaries in the fallopian tube or, or in the uterine cavity and potentially non-invasively using uh, using an optical measurement uh, be able to detect the the amount of biomarker at that location so at the local source of, of where the biomarkers have been being produced so to do that we are using uh, single wall carbon nanotubes um, carbon nanotubes uh, uh, come in a variety of different, um, different uh, species, uh, as you can see here. Um, most importantly to note that they all have different fluorescence, near-infrared fluorescence output. Um, and, and so that near-infrared fluorescence output, you can kind of see here. Um, I, I like to say that these are nanotubes floating in solution. Uh, some people might think they're, they're bacteria, but I promise they're not. They're, they're nanotubes. Uh, uh, this is near-infrared fluorescence of, of those nanotubes. Um, so you can see them well dispersed producing a bright fluorescence floating in, in solution. Um, this near infrared fluorescence is sort of in the tissue, uh, um, the, uh, the tissue window of, of um, the ability to see light. Uh, so we can see here this tissue transparent emission. Um, it, it, uh, it, you can clearly see in a, a, a whole mouse, you know, sort of single veins here, uh, single vessels, even in a mouse uh, brain here, you can see sort of single vessels in this in this window of, of relatively tissue transparent light. Um, so these single wall carbon nanotubes, also importantly, they don't photo bleach. So compared to a lot of uh, normal fluorescent molecules, normal fluorophores, uh, which would um, get dimmer over time with laser, uh, laser excitation, uh, carbon nanotubes don't do that. Um, so, so this is important for sort of long-term uh, development of sensors. So we also uh, know that uh, potentially most importantly, nanotubes can respond to their local environment. So they can get brighter or dimmer based on sort of the uh, electron donating or accepting groups in the local environment. And they can also change wavelength uh, based on whether they're more hydrophobic or more hydrophilic things near them. Um, so this is all good, but the most important thing is that we can kind of uh, uh, engineer this sensitivity to be able to detect exactly what we want it to detect. Um, so to sort of get towards that, uh, the first thing we did was we wrapped single wall carbon nanotubes with uh, single stranded DNA. And this sort of suspends it well in solution, it makes it fluorescent, uh, because normally nanotubes are, are very hydrophobic. They, they sort of bunch together um, and they look like this powder and, and they're not fluorescent. They're not very useful, at least for, for biosensing. So with single-stranded DNA wrapped around our nanotubes, we added um, an antibody for the biomarker we want to detect, in this case, HE4. Um, so now we have this, uh, this uh, um, potential nano sensor here that has the, the antibody that's going to hopefully bring our biomarker um, uh, close to the surface. Um, so our, our sensor itself is sort of well dispersed in solution, and we can see that here from absorbance spectra. And we also have a lot of uh, fluorescent um, nanotube species and sort of uh, present in that solution. Um, and, and so our uh, fluorescent nanotube species, um, we, we can see that they have this particular fluorescence output. When HE4 binds to that, uh, we see a change, a, a shift in the uh, fluorescent wavelength. Um, and that shift in the fluorescent wavelength is something that is uh, uh, we can we can monitor with different concentrations. We see with increasing concentrations of HE4, we see um, uh, an increasingly large change in the fluorescence wavelength. Um, in this case, it's a, a change towards a uh, lower wavelength, or or in this case, what we call a blue shift because it's towards the blue end of the of the uh, uh, fluorescent spectrum. Um, so here we see that the um, the, the shift does indeed increase uh, sort of over a range of 10 to 500 nanomolar. Um, and this concentration range is important because it, it is, um, sort of covers that concentration range of, um, of biomarkers, uh, or HE4 that appears in the uterine cavity and sort of the upper range of, bio, uh, of HE4 that appears in the serum. So the sensor itself is uh, specific for HE4. This is obviously, you know, probably the most important uh, facet of sensor development in, in that. So we have our, our sensor uh, by itself here. 
Um, if we add other proteins that are not AT4, um, even a bunch of proteins here, which is just serum, uh, we see no real change, no, no real shift. Um, but when we add AT4, we see our characteristic blue shift, and we only see that with our biomarker interest. Uh, so the next thing we did um, was we wanted to show that this actually works with patient uh, serum and, and patient fluid. Um, so here we took patient serum from three patients that had a uh, high-grade serous carcinoma of the ovaries um, and three who had other benign ovarian conditions. Um, and we sort of measured the, the fact that these, um, these uh, HGSCs uh, had indeed had higher levels of, of, the, um, of the biomarker HG4. And we could see, we, we could indeed see a, a, a blue shift here um, in patients who had ovarian cancer and had higher levels of that, that biomarker. Um, so we did the same thing with patient ascites. So ascites are the sort of fluid floating around the peritoneal cavity uh, along with cells of patients who have ovarian cancer. Uh, so this is sort of a, a hallmark that, and indeed those cells um, do produce uh, AT4 and that sort of floats around in the, in the cavity as well. So again, we showed that in, um, in, in a, a patient, um, inpatient samples that have ovarian cancer, we can again detect that, that AT4 levels. So that, that was all well and good. We created something that worked in a cell and or worked in a, a sensor and worked in a, a test tube. Um, but we wanted to create something that could actually uh, be used in vivo um, inside a live animal uh, for, for further uh, translation. Um, so the idea was that we took our sensor and we put that inside a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and from outside the body, we would take a, uh, a laser pointer type probe device and, and sort of just shine, shine that um, on the skin where the sensor was and we could get the fluorescent emission out. Um, so to do that, we put our sensor inside of this uh, semi-permeable membrane. Um, the nanotubes were too large to leak out um, and the biomarker itself is, is small enough to go past in and out of this membrane. Um, and here is just evidence that we can detect biomarkers that, that come through the membrane. So what we did then was we put the sensor inside of a live mouse and you can just sort of see a, a real quick here um, implanting that sensor. And you can sort of see here uh, a whole um, animal near infrared imaging um, where we can actually see the sensor itself. And, and this is bright um, and it's not leaking, it's staying in place. And this happens uh, over you know, a period of days and, and, and it's very stable, um, stably implanted. So the next step was we took, um, took the sensor uh, inside a number of uh, animals and, and we um, injected into those animals either BSA, so uh, albumin as a control globular protein, uh, or HE4, our, our biomarker of interest. And then we did a near-infrared probe spectroscopy, right, which again, is just that sort of laser pointer light detection system um, with three second data acquisition. And you can see here a, a mouse getting maybe an extra second to snap a picture um, uh, and, and um, we can see that um, when we inject BSA, we, we see really no um, specific change, uh, sort of baseline uh, sensor characteristics over time. Um, but when, when we inject our biomarker of interest, HE4, uh, we do see uh, uh, that characteristic blue shift. Um, and here we're just short, sort of showing that, you know, after 15 minutes, that is, um, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, statistically and, and you know, biologically significant. And the amount that we injected really um, is, is the, the shift is, is similar to what we saw in vitro. So that, that change is, is very similar and sort of benchmarked to what we saw. Um, so the next step was to take, um, take a, a ovarian cancer uh, cell lines that produce AG4 um, and, and put those into models of mice. Um, and so these two cell lines don't produce AT4, and these two do. Um, so this is just evidence that the cell lines are growing in all of the mice. And we did the same probe spectroscopy. And we found that in mice that produced AT4, uh, we again saw that characteristic blue shift in, in all of uh, six or seven mice that produced AT4 um, compared with the uh, eight or so mice that did not produce AT4. We saw very little change uh, compared to baseline. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the hope is, and hopefully I've convinced you that sort of towards the future, we've, we've uh, have been able to develop and, and should be able to develop uh, 
and it's sort of an implantable uh, intrauterine type device that we can sort of non-invasively, minimally invasively measure the amount of biomarker at or near the source of, of ovarian cancer. Um, and, and so just to sort of get back to this, this idea, um, uh, you know, we're, we're again, we're sort of co-opting the uh, antibody and uh, antigen interactions with the immune system to hopefully, uh, you know, see what's going on inside the body and, and uh, go see what's going on inside the body and, and measure the, um, measure the uh, amount of um, cancer development as well as progression. <clears throat> uh, so sort of that's some work I've been doing um, for the past few years. And, and so um, in future work, my lab, and, and this, is my, this is my group picture, because like I said, um, we really just got up and running this semester. So, uh, so, so I thought it would, what, what more, um, what more uh, uh, <laughs> good, good for the situation than a, a Zoom live meeting photo. Um, so again, we're sort of uh, uh, hoping to, to work with uh, engineers, biomaterial scientists, nanotechnologists um, to develop assays to understand molecular biology of, of, um, of cancer and other diseases, as well as to translate some of these materials to the clinic. Um, and so sort of I, I, like this, uh, I, I like this idea so much, maybe I'll, I'll change this to making materials, uh, hacking biology and hacking treatment with materials. Um, and, and so here's some of the funding sources from my time at uh, Sloan Kettering and our um, collaborators. And, and I, I really appreciate you guys uh, inviting me and, and everyone listening. Hope to have a good discussion soon. Great, thank you to all of our speakers. I think those were, were wonderful talks. Uh, we have a few minutes for Q&A. So um, we are opening up the chat. If you have a question, uh, please feel free to submit it. Um, I'm gonna start off um, by asking something that any one of the speakers can chime in on. The pathway from the lab to the clinic is uh, notoriously difficult. Um, so I'm wondering if um, each of you could maybe comment briefly on what you think are is maybe the, the biggest hurdle for what you're working on actually reaching um, the clinic. And I don't know if you can comment on how maybe um, a university like CUNY could help with that. Okay, I, I can start. Um, so uh, I think the best is uh, to partner with clinicians. Uh, so. Um, I think uh, for me it helped because my postdoctoral uh, fellowship is at Memorial Sloan Kettering, so I already had connections with, with Sloan Kettering a lot before I come to CUNY. So and and Sloan has basically this platform where um, they have a translational um, experimental therapeutic institute. So basically, uh, they they if they see the potential, they kind of uh, you know feed into this experimental therapeutic institute, and then they do all this preclinical development. So I think the best is to partner with, uh, you know, MD, PhDs or MDs and, and, and get their, get their uh, advice on, because most of the stuff we do in a laboratory, mostly not translatable, it's mostly proof of concept studies, but if we really want to, uh, you know, push something to a clinical level that we really have to work with clinicians because they have a really a true picture of what works, what doesn't work um, than us. So I think that that's my my basic uh, uh, you know strategy that you know uh, you know partner with clinicians and 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 the connections you already have to to basically uh, push whatever the technology you have and then have that in your mind when you start your experiments to begin with not just to publish a paper. So. Great, excellent. Um, if anyone does, anyone else want to? jump in well i could just comment that in yeah. general thanks for the question if we talk about um nanomedicine you know the big pharma doesn't necessarily have expertise in large-scale manufacturing so um because traditionally they've been manufacturing small molecules and antibodies so to really partner with industry and come up with those manufacturing solutions to bring this to thousands if not millions of patients Great. Um, in the chat, Joy, we have a question for you, which is, 
uh, whether you can use genetic engineering approaches to modify the contents of extracellular vesicles or other approaches? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the strategies to load extracellular vesicles with therapeutic uh, agents is to engineer the cell source. So for instance, the cells can uh, express the therapeutic protein and you can even make a recombinant protein so that it's enriched in the extracellular vesicle. So that's a great question and thank you for highlighting that. Great. Um, we also have a question for Ryan. Um, for your interventions, I mean, obviously we're looking at implanting something inside of a human body. Um, so under what conditions do you think you might, this might be the appropriate therapeutic approach? And do you know if there are any side effects of carbon nanotubes that we need to, to consider? Yeah, thanks, Nina. They, you're, you're, those are wonderful questions and, and definitely something that, that we, um, we usually, uh, usually like to, to, to answer uh, right off the bat. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. So our, um, we don't imagine this sort of sensor being used for every, uh, every person, every female in the population. Um, it's, it, it, you know, generally wouldn't be a, a good screen for many years for many people. Um, but uh, the, the best case scenario really, um, at least to begin with, is, is that we um, implant the sensor into um, patients who have already uh, uh, have a, a, a high risk for ovarian cancer. So family history, uh, BRCA mutations, um, uh, there are other risk factors as well. Um, and maybe the first way into the clinic for this probably is, is to be able to um, place it, uh, uh, sensors into patients who've already been diagnosed with ovarian cancer um, and, and they're currently undergoing treatment so that we can uh, monitor for relapse or monitor for progression of, of disease. Um, and so that, 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 you know, that's sort of one idea um, uh, to you know, address some of the you know, safety of nanotubes. And the answer is, is these nanotubes by themselves um, are relatively safe. Uh, I, we have them, we, we've uh, done a fair amount of testing with, with these to show that, that um, with, wrapped with uh, uh, single-stranded DNA, um, well dispersed in solution, they're, they're fairly safe. But you know, to take that a step further, really we're implanting these nanotubes inside of this device um, so we don't really imagine that the, the, the nanotubes um, themselves are going to interact uh, with, the, with the, the tissue or with immune cells or anything themselves anyway. Um, so, so really we're sort of relying on that sort of two steps that the material itself as functionalized is, is safe um, and that we're sort of separating it from, from the body into a device that's been used uh, in the clinic for, for many years. Um, and uh, so we're, we're working with a, um, a startup company and, and, um, uh, and an engineering firm to develop these nanotube sensors into, um, into this uh, uh, IUD type implantable device. Um, and maybe to loop back to your, your, your first question there uh, a bit. So uh, uh, the, the other speakers have you know, mentioned um, thinking about scale up and thinking about working with clinicians. And that's definitely uh, important for translation of materials to the clinic. But uh, also we want to think about the, uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, identifying um, early stage partners in, in industry, whether that be startup companies that we spin out of uh, our labs. Um, and in the case of this company, it is a startup company that spun out of Dan's lab at, at Sloan Kettering. Um, and, uh, and, and you know the ability to to really um, gather you know financial backing it, it it's something that really is important and, and I think CUNY itself is is um, doing a great job I know the sensor uh, cats uh, program and 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 other um, developmental programs uh, uh, that CUNY um, and the uh, tech um, TOC office are are working on are are really awesome and that's something that that really should be useful for many years for the university. Great. Maybe you can also give a seminar on how to generate startup companies because that's well I'll I'll, uh, I'll defer to Dan if he's still around yeah. but uh, but, um, but yeah it's, yeah it's definitely exciting. 
Um, so one more question before we move on to the breakout sessions. This is for Joy. Uh, what is the advantage of the extracellular vesicles compared to liposomes, which are also used for targeted drug delivery? Yeah, thank you for the question. So this is a great point. So the liposomes have been approved since the 1990s. So, um, you know, we know a lot about them. So what, what, what is the advantage of now starting to use this actually vesicle? Well, these liposomes typically have maybe two or three different lipids and then one or two therapeutic agents. So it's a very simple system. So with Exile vessels, they have thousands and thousands of proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. And so it's getting that complexity that would be almost impossible if we tried to uh, synthesize it um, in the lab. So just tapping into the biological complexity that has taken millions of years of evolution to, um, to optimize. Great. I really like this idea that we're, we're also hacking evolution, <laughs> just hacking everything. Um, all right, so we want to move into the breakout sessions now. But before we do that, I just, want to send, I just want to give you guys a few reminders. One is that we are doing an interdisciplinary poster session on Twitter. Um, so if you search for the CUNY Converge hashtag, um, you'll see all of the posters that have been uh, submitted from students and postdocs throughout CUNY. And, they're really wonderful, so please check those out. Also today is the New York primary election, so if you have not, the polls are open until nine. Um, and as a wrap up, um, we are gonna be sending out some, um, some things that we've learned from the 